Okay, Matt, let's um, fire up a couple of those little picks, shall we? On to slide two, yeah. So just right. before we, uh, just whilst we're waiting for um, a few more people to log in, we we'll, might just have a quick little chat with Coco and a bit of history here. I've um, got a couple of photos that um, Frank Queerly from the uh, 18 footer league in Double Bay has very kindly uh, provided us with. And we've even found one of Coco back in the day. Oh, Jesus. Uh, so <laughs> <it's just laughs> a couple of us, actually. <laughs> yeah, couple it's, of that goes back into the 1970s, late 70s. Uh, so the, the colour bond on the left hand side was my tw first uh, 18 foot skiff I designed. And um, it was, you might know, it hasn't got a bowsprit. Um, it was a pretty radical in its day and uh, had some glimpses of, uh, um, glimpses of fame, but uh, I was probably a bit young to work out what were the good parts and what were the bad parts about <laughs> it. But uh, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a fun experience. Um, you'll notice there it's got a Dacron mainsail and jib. So that shows you the, how far we're going back in time yes. there. And then on the right-hand photo, you've got the KB, which was the boat I had after uh, Color Bond. And um, that's uh, the first Kevlar mainsail that was ever in Australia. So wow. we've gone from, from Dacron to Kevlar then. And she didn't, I remember we jumped through that salad and last, it didn't have a long history, but it, uh, it was the first of that. Uh, <laughs> was, how, how much lighter Coco was it oh, than, uh, than the Dacron ones you were putting oh, uh, It was way lighter. Um, yeah. It, it uh, Basically, the jib on the colour bond on the left hand side that was a two ply sail, so uh, we used to build them two ply to wow. try and stop them, the, the leeches dropping out in them. So, the, the uh, definitely the Kevlar was it was mainly a lot of mylar in it, but a lot of yep. Kevlar uh, reinforcing yarns too. So, yep. it was sort of a, ahead of its time uh, in that way. And you might notice also that boat's got um, wing aluminium wings on are hanging off yep. it. Well, it wasn't originally designed with that but that was in the era where wings started to become into the, uh, the forefront. And there weren't, only were two rules, be at the start at 2.30 and uh, 18 foot long. So uh, um, someone cottoned on to, in fact, there was a <laughs> gentleman uh, named Richard Court in Perth uh, actually worked out that if you started to extend the width of your boat, you went faster. So he came over to a regatta um, over in Sydney and uh, was a pretty well unknown, but he used to blow everyone's socks off off the starting line. And by the next uh, by the next race, twenty four hours later, we were all bolting on bits of aluminium and so on to the sides of the boat to, to get more writing moment. And, and then the, it went from there, and the boats ended up uh, uh, over eighteen foot wide for eighteen foot long. Um, yeah. yeah, so it was interesting times. But the compression in the rigs used to uh, be a real problem. So that in those days, they're aluminium mast. And the mast actually couldn't take the extra riding moment. So you'd, you'd be building onto your wings. Uh, so one of your team would be building onto the wings of a welder and the other guys would be in the sail loft uh, adding luff curve to the well, mast. And uh, let's have a look at the next slide, Matt. And here, so, same, well, actually, as you say, they're not the same. Are they the same two boats, Coco? The Cole Bond's Yeah, the, the same, same two one, boats. The, the yeah. KB there is the year before, um, same boat, but the year before, and uh, it hasn't got the wings there. So that yeah. was uh, it's sort of a little bit in reverse order. Um, this was the start of composite 18 foot skiffs. Um, uh, Ian Murray had dominated the class for oh, a number of years, and I think he won six uh, JJs in a row. And Ian started off with a plywood boat and then uh, went into developing with John McConaughey the composite construction 18 footers. So the colour bond I recall was a uh, foam boat with um, uh, Kevlar and I think the, the KB was a uh, honeycomb boat and I think it might have had carbon in it. Uh, I know it had titanium in all the uh, um, insert internal structures. So it was sort of the beginning of the development of, of lighter hulls and uh, more modern, uh, using more modern materials, which was slowly then up. The next effect on that was to go into the sails and, and eventually into the mast. Yeah. And I suppose probably the budgets um, 
were quite high, I suppose, to it, you know, relatively speaking. That they were. Um, the, they, both those boats had four complete rigs. Uh, so that meant four masts. Um, we used to have three centre boards. Um, we had 12 spinnakers. Um, yeah, so it was a pretty big deal. Uh, and sponsorship was a big deal, obviously, yeah. to, to fund all that. Um, but, you know, it, yeah, and the boats were unlimited in design. Uh, you could actually do what you like. So people were designing their own boats and, mm. and uh, really having a good, good play at it. Yeah, no, good, old, good times, I would have thought, Coco, back then. Uh, yeah, it was fun being a, a, young, a young kid there. A yeah. lot of uh, sailing during the day and drinking during the night. Yeah. <laughs> <Good> stuff. <laughs> Operating for <Right>. the stuff. <laughs> Hasn't changed that much, I don't suppose. No, okay. <laughs> other than breath okay, okay. came in. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, right, should we move on to our sort of introduction and we'll uh, get cracking with um, what we really want to talk about? Okay, so welcome everyone to um, our first Alien for Skiff webinar. Um, with me today is Michael Coxon, um, very well known skiff sailor from Sydney, who's been doing the skiffs as you've probably just heard for many, many years. And uh, with us as well is uh, Matt Stephen from New Zealand, North South New Zealand. Uh, Matt has just won the JJ um, Championship for the third year in a row which is a pretty amazing achievement. Uh, got a little way to go yet to beat Ian Murray's record, um, but he's had a pretty good start so far. And uh, myself, Dick Parker, also from North Sales, um, sail designer and former skiff sailor when I was... Yeah. So, Dick, tell us a little bit about yourself because you have uh, <laughs> did your apprenticeship here. Um, I've been working in this same building since 1978, which is sad. Yeah, um, and uh, you did your apprenticeship here with us. I, I certainly did. Yeah, nineteen. Well, well, I don't know when. I, yeah, nineteen eighty six. I started uh, here today, which I was actually explained to the, some of the guys upstairs, and they were um, a bit shocked actually. <laughs> but uh, there we go. Yeah, and so I did a little bit of skiff sailing from about ninety two to ninety six, um, which was sort of uh, towards the end of the Grand Prix, um, Bill McCartney's Grand Prix that was on the TV on the cricket cricket breaks and uh, then sort of did a couple of years at the Adam Foot Skiff League um, with the 14 foot wings. Yeah, so it was fabulous times and then moved to Europe after that and um, had 20 years in Europe and have now just uh, re returned back to Australia to carry on and here we are. Uh, you, can, you can go but you can never leave. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, Matt, I thought we'd um, start off with, with you, a little bit of a chat about the JJ. And um, first things first, I think we should just probably um, nail down what, what gear you had, uh, you know, you were using for the JJ, which I think you've presented for us in this next slide. Yep, yep. So, I'm obviously part of three guys on the team. We've got um, Dave and Brad. Uh, they're both pretty exceptional sailors. And... Um, Dave's had a background in 49ers. Um, Brad's, he's definitely the athlete of the team and gets us on the track for sure. Um, so for this year, we, this is our inventory we had. Well, we had obviously we've got North Sales, but um, so our, our main sales, we had our number one and our number two main were both um, 3DO Raw and they were both built in 2017. Um, and then our two jibs, we got them built this season um, and we just sort of, we introduced the new Helix technology, um, sort of looking into load sharing and the benefits of that, which we might touch on a bit later tonight. Um, and then our kites, our number one kite was built for last year's JJ, and then our number two kite we've had for three years now. Um, so it might be a bit um, of a surprise to some that some of our sales are so old, but um, we don't have unlimited budgets over here. Um, and this is a, probably a credit to the 3DI as well. Our mainsails have lasted so long. Um, we, did, we talked about maybe replacing our mainsail this year, but, uh, one of our mains, but um, in the end, it, we were pretty happy with what we had and we knew it was fast. So and, and, can I, and can I just ask, Matt, how many sort of days training or sailing would you do over in New Zealand you know, in the season up leading up to the JJ? Yeah, so typically we don't we don't have the fleet size the Aussies have. We've only got um, 
each year we have between four up to eight boats sometimes. So we don't really get as much racing practice. So we've got to sort of do a lot by ourselves. Um, sort of traditionally in the past, we'd do blocks of training. Mm -hmm. so maybe two weeks, we would go out for four or five days a week. And that's sort of a, a good block. And we might do another block for the JJs. Um, and we race every fortnight over here. So this year was a bit different. We had uh, Dave, our skipper, had another another baby, and right at the start of the season, which wasn't great timing. So we um, we sort of started a late build up, and also with the 49er Natural Worlds here in New Zealand, we sort of we we lost our ramp, um, so in our, our yacht club, unfortunately. But we we kicked into it in January, and we did about a two week block, and then another three week block just before we came over to ship the boats. Uh, and then we lose lose the boats for three weeks. So we mm. we probably get in maybe uh, twenty five to thirty days this year, which is pretty slim. But we we did just enough. So, so, so Matt, when you're doing your training, um, is it just one off with yourselves, or do you have a coach? Uh, how do you go about it to achieve your goals? Are you working on speed, technique, uh, boat handling? How do you go about your training program? Uh, you yeah, know, we don't have a coach, but we um we have. We have uh, CTEC's pretty reliable trading partner, uh, Alex Valente, he's still buzzing at the sort of Leighton's career, or he might keep going for many more years to come, I'd say. But um, we go out, when we have another boat, we'll go do um, some speed testing. Uh, maybe we did four or five sessions this year. And then otherwise, we just prioritise boat handling, really. Um, our goal, yeah, if we can get the boat around the corners faster, it's yeah, pretty much 80% of the way in the rest. Yeah, so certainly as a, an observer watching the races um, and at no disrespect to any other competitors, but you, I think most people would agree that you're pretty smooth around the corners and just each maneuver you just look like you're a little slicker than uh, most of the other crews out there. So you'd say 25 days of training. That's, that's a lot of training. That's probably what we did this year. We sort of 20, 20 to 25 days sailing the whole season, which... right. By so our standards, it's pretty slim, but um, yeah, but it was it, still, it, it was enough. Yeah, is there more benefit in the racing or the training? Do you think? Um, well, we'd love to do more racing if we could. We sort of every year. We you never. It's funny coming over from New Zealand. You, you never quite know where the fleet is at in Australia, so that you don't you don't know how fast they're going. Um, you can see the racing on TV, so you can get an idea for boat handling and racing tactics. But um, when we turn up, we're sort of we're never quite sure, and not having done a, we I think we did six races all season, so not having done a race as, with the with the fleet as such is a bit nervous. But when we line up for the practice race or the first race, we get a pretty good feeling of where we're at. Um, so yeah, ideally we'd love to do more racing, but with the with that amount of training, it's um, our boat handling is. Yeah, definitely up to scratch. Okay, should we um, crack on with our first little uh, video clip, which is uh, from the JJ? And um, oops, a bit too far. Um, so this video clip, I think, I thought Matt, you could just run us through a little bit about um, you know moding of the boat, and you know what was going through your mind when um, you know uh, the winning group sort of tackled a little bit bow forward on you here um, and this is obviously one of those light air days on the beat up to up into Rose Bay oh, look at this. yeah so um, I'll just sort of talk through where we were at in this situation um, I think the winning group would probably obviously like to attack a little bit close to us but I think we might have just hit a piece of their stern um, as soon as they tacked the communication our boat we kind of wanted to go high mode um, and at this time, we saw right-hand pressure filtering down um, from Rose Bay. And then, so all, all we were focused on was purely, we couldn't tack because of our Finport boat. And we just needed to go as high as possible. Um, and you can kind of see, this is maybe 10 seconds after winning groups done their tack. Um, and you can kind of see the difference in boat trim and sail trim. Uh, but see, this main strip on as hard as possible. Not, we're not letting the boat come flat and we're climbing off. Um, I think the winning group went straight into a normal BMG mode, which kind of helped us out a little bit there. 
Um, I'll just go forward a bit more. And then you can kind of see as it goes on, we lose a lot of ground forward. But as much as we lose forward, we're sort of gaining a little bit here and there to windward. Um, I think within about 30 seconds, we might be two lengths above their line. But obviously you can see about 30 metres back. So there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a lot of port to do, really, was there? There was, there was probably at yeah, that yeah. point it was probably eighty percent, eighty ninety percent starboard, ten percent port, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, maybe it's slightly more port. Well, you're probably about right, seventy seventy five to twenty five or seventy eight thirty. Mm. Um, then we'll just skip forward a little bit, and then you can see into the situation now. We've started to get a little bit of right hand pressure, and the boat's accelerating. Might be mm. thirty seconds after. Again, we're like strapped on as hard as we can, pretty much. And and do you do you have adjustable shrouds on on your boat? Uh, we've just got the simple lever system that was developed yeah. about three years ago. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we at, at this point we don't touch, don't touch it. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're not uh, Matt. You're not using your uh, shroud tension through the wind range. Uh, we do. Yeah, we we sort of. We pull it on basically as a it's a pretty crude adjustment. It's basically either on or off. Uh, right. So, so, we've, so we've today this is a light a couple of three light air raises from memory. Um you would have been pretty soft lever up uh, on this one, were you? Yeah, the levers are up in the air, so it's um mm -hmm. it's basically base setting for us. Yeah. Um and then so then the SMEG has a go and tries to get onto us as well, and then sort of same. Fortunately, the attack wasn't quite as good as the winning group. Um, but yeah, coming forward, and then at this point here, this is probably two minutes after. Um, we've sort of sort of get this is the pressure's about to hit us, but we've gained just from basically shooting on and not letting the bike tip over too much to windward. We've gained a serious amount to windward, and then at about this point, we get the pressure. And that was probably the difference between, oh, sorry. Lost it there. Um, that's probably the difference between maybe being fourth at the top mark or potentially being eighth or ninth at the top mark. Um, so, as the winning group, sort of, oh, I've done it again. Anyway, the winning group tacked onto Leyline there and couldn't get across us, they had to dip, and we shot through, and I think we put around third or fourth, and they were down an eight. Yeah. And I, you know, just, just from looking at that, you know, you can just sort of, you know, maintaining leech tension is obviously just generating power in the rig, and, you know, in those conditions when you're only just three wiring, it's just, it's crucial to, you know, keep the boat wicked up as much as you possibly can. So, and I think this is another little example here, and I think, Coco, you had brought up a couple of, good points on this one and one of them was regarding um, the main sheet bridle itself. Yeah, um, well firstly just to clarify this, this uh, Tech 2 only were just on the water at this stage. Uh, she was a, a, late, uh, a late launching for the season and um, so they're you know, just basically settling themselves in and did pretty well. I think they won the first regatta they went into and this is just leading into uh, that I think. Um, so what I see here, and this is uh, not uh, being critical of Tech 2, but something I look for in light airs is to make sure that the main sheet block goes to block with the bridle. In other words, the bridle length is very critical. You've got to make sure your bridle is set up exactly to the leech twist you want at maximum trim on. And uh, so what I see here is there's actually still quite a bit of gap between the, the bridle and the block. And I think we worked with Jack... Uh, during that afternoon and got the bridle set up right and got it so where, where the, the leash tension is pretty good there and the twist is pretty nice except for there's still the gap. So you want to have the bridle let up so the blo blocks go to block so the main sheet trimmer doesn't have to keep looking back and seeing am I maximum uh, sheeting here. Uh, he can actually just feel it and then uh, that, that goes to maximum sheet. The other thing I, I see here is something to work on from a crew point of view and again, these guys only we just got on the water, is we've got the forward end cl climbing in while the uh, skipper and sheet hand are still straight-legged. 
So it's really important to get that three crew working together and, and coordinating their, their movements together because it becomes pretty clunky when you actually start getting a guy jumping over the wing and the others are still out there. So just little things that you can see, there's very little breeze, but uh, just a little bit of finesse, which is one of the other things we always see on Honda. They very smooth around all of these edges and these corners. It's uh, something that shows out to me. Um, we're also looking at the, that day, the mainsail depth, whether we, it was actually a pretty interesting exercise that boat. Um, Jack uh, McCartney decided he, um, it was late and he said, well, I just want to set up with the same mast and sail set up as uh, what Honda is. So these sails were straight out of the box. Um, the mast, the, the mainsail, everything, jib, everything was straight out of the box without uh, um, anything being measured prior. So I think it's a credit and that is a credit to Matt was and uh, uh, C Tech were able to provide the uh, information we needed just to reproduce the sales, the same as the uh, Honda sales, which we did and that boat went pretty nicely straight out of the box. Yeah. Okay, Matt, should we, should we click on to the, uh, the next one, which I think is a really quite an interesting um, little clip, this one, isn't it? With uh, Winnie and Honda, um, Northeast Sea Breeze, you know, just coming into Bradley's, probably the second tack probably into Bradley's, I would have thought. Um, and a, a really quite a nice Lee Bow tack here from from um, from the winning group. I'm just going to play that clip there. Yeah, so this, this probably was what the regatta that, oh, the race that could have de could have defined the regatta, I guess, in some ways. Um, sort of coming, this sort of, well, this situation kind of developed a wee way back, I think the winning group led us around the top mark by about 15 seconds. And then coming to the bottom mark, they still had a decent lead. And then we went for a split around the gates. And I think every time we've done this course the whole week, the uh, right hand gate facing downwind, which would lead you into Bradley's head, was favoured. But this one time, I think it must have drifted or something. And it opened up the left hand turn to be, prob to be more favoured. Um, so we managed to get that off them. and sort of ended up in a situation where we could attack them and this situation unfolded. Uh, so they attacked a lot and we, we, or we, as we, we would have thought we would have rolled them, but they were banged up to speed real quick, surprisingly. Um, it was quite impressive. And then it's quite a good thing to know here, I guess, that you can see the setups of the two boats together and to my eyes, our orange stripes, you can see our shape a lot better or easier. Um, then you can see other shapes, but to me the setup's very similar um, in the way they're sailing the boat. I think credit to Debbie Scott and Sam, they pretty much copied, <laughs> copied our style throughout the regatta and by the end of it you saw them sailing with a woman here like we always do. Um, and they mentioned that in their speech at the prize giving, they finally clicked on to put the boat on top of themselves. But um, you yeah, coming in, we've sort of got we've, Sailing all the way through, we did exactly the same, exact same speed. Setup looks pretty similar. Um, and then from here, we go into attack. And then uh, I think we get the better of this attack just. And so at the moment, you'd say winning group was slightly controlling. They've got room to attack, they ask for water. And then from here, I think we did maybe six or seven attacks to the top mark. And we kind of managed to put few links on them every tack but um it's quite it was pretty awesome for us we um before this regatta started we said to ourselves it'd be great to face that combination of Stevie, scott and sam and um, we got the opportunity to do that so uh, unfortunately herman had to pull out of the regatta for business reasons with the virus and whatnot but um we got that we got our chance to race those guys and it was a in the end, it was a pretty good battle. I think the scoreboard didn't quite show it, but going into this race, if the result was flipped the other way, it would have been all on. Um, so, yeah. And, and Matt, a question for you. Um, would have you been in upwind, would have you been happy to sail either boat, speed-wise? Yeah, totally, yeah. Like we could, we're maybe not quite as familiar with their systems, but um, if, I think, yeah, Boat feed wise, I don't think it would have changed a whole lot at all. No. There may have been some slightly different settings required for um, the way they had their boat set up and the rig, but I, without knowing their gear at all, um, 
yeah. Every time we got close to them, the same speed, speed seemed to be pretty, pretty similar. Right. And, and, and the crew weights, uh, you're sailing about 252 from memory. Um, and I think uh, uh, the um, winning group was sort of close to 270, maybe 267, 268. So there's about 15 kilos difference, which um, uh, do you feel that the setup, you had to set up differently to them or vice versa because of the weight difference? Um, it doesn't appear we set up too much differently. Um, we're definitely, yeah, they are they're big boy, bigger boys. Um, Dave on the back of the boat is, doesn't, doesn't add much weight to the weight combo for us. But um, yeah, I think we, or you can see it, we sort of benefit downward obviously from being lighter than them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's quite sort of noticeable just... is uh, your downwind, downwind speed is uh, you, you seem to always have a nice, and again, you look very smooth, but you be able to, seem to be able to work your way down a little deeper than most boats out there. So what yeah. do you put that down to? Um, I think Dave, I, I, I back Dave as a skipper person. He's pretty smooth on the helm um, steering. We've been a pretty, we've been a combination for four or five years now. So between Brad and Dave trimming and steering. There's little, little things all add up. We're a little bit lighter than some of the Aussie crews that were at the top of the fleet, mm -hmm. which definitely contribute to it. Um, so I'd say that that's the two biggest factors for sure. Mm. And, and uh, Matt, so, and Coco for that matter, the, the rig setup between these two boats, how in terms of D tensions and top mast tensions, are they gonna be pretty similar, do you think? Well, I don't know where Matt's numbers are exactly, but I mean, yeah, if using a lose gauge, the, uh, you know, I set the four stay up uh, at 36 as a, as a mean setting. Uh, so when you're doing a luff curve and uh, the average um, D2s on around 24 and around 28 on the top stays, that'll sort of get you in the ballpark of being a competitive 18 footer. Uh, everything's, custom though so from then on you've got to work around your crew weight your, your mass stiffness um but, but that'll get you in the ballpark of getting out in the water and having a look at it i don't know where your settings are maybe yeah we, we don't do, use, use a loose gauge so i wouldn't know but it sounds about right or you're not going to tell us one of the well, like, uh, <laughs> I'd like you say every every mass in the fleet is different um <laughs> there's nothing there's nothing in the fleet that's exactly the same so yeah. the yeah. best thing is to get out there for the teams i'd recommend yeah. and just yeah. change and test and try yeah, yeah, yeah. you can um yeah. pull more on let more off while you're out there yeah take some yeah. take some spent yeah. and so, so moving on to the next slide uh maddie so this is just on that on that whole subject of um of, of retune and obviously we can we can see two photos here and I think, Coco, you took these too, didn't you? Remember? Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're actually a year apart, but, uh, um, but they happen to be very similar area on uh, uh, going up into Rose Bay. Um, one on a very nice day and one on a, just as uh, leading into the lovely rain you had for the JJs this year um, with the winning group. The winning group shot photo was actually taken at about 10 past seven in the morning. So uh, that's dedication for you after we stood around for an hour rigging up in the rain. Um, so the, the reason we selected these two photos is uh, just to give uh, an overview on uh, how mass setup can change and um, uh, the twist profile. So basically we see on the left-hand side, the winning group um, is uh, fairly firm in its uh, leech twist and uh, you know, looks pretty powered up there. The ASCO there um, is um, what I'd call a lot more open in the twist setup, um, a lot deeper at the bottom stripe. Uh, and the thing I really see is there's more tip layoff on the ASCO. So uh, the tip layoff tends to induce the yet more open leech. Um, depends what you're trying to achieve. Um, going VMG upwind, you tend to want a firmer leech if you want to go uh, faster and lower, uh, the more open setup would be uh, 
the way to go. Um, what do you see there, Matt? Yeah, pretty similar. See, um, I think like on ESCO, they're probably starting to see their lower capture or top mast go starting to go loose in the past, I'd say. The other thing, um, just that, yeah, again, like that lower, I don't know if you see my mouse, but the lower, um, mm. below the first spreader, you can see the bit of a gap in there and the look like a little bit of sag in the bottom of the mast, so the leech is quite open down low. And like you said, if you if your top's falling off, you're losing a bit of ability to take height, but then if the bottom's falling off, you've got no ability really to go high. Mm. Yeah. So that's yeah. going to be tough there. You'd have to work a lot harder with the ASCO setup yep, to, yep. as a crew to, to maintain it. But it's just, just I thought it interesting to look at the differences of, uh, of, of the two setups. And um, I'm sure a lot of it is just in setup. And uh, no doubt the, you know, I, I don't know what ASCO situation was at the time. They just might've been trying something a little bit different, but I think winning's more like, looks like the Honda setup there to me. And uh, that was the uh, just the week leading into the JJs, and, and we're out there having a good look at it. Mm. Yeah, like like I said, for if you for the teams out there, if you take out a, tier, a set of um, spanners, you can pull those lowers on and see what happens. And try and if you've got a coach boat out there like you had there taking photos, it's it's pretty uh, eighteen foot skipper. It's pretty easy to see, I, I reckon. You got so much adjustment, four sets of stays. Hey, I was just reading uh, one of the little messages we got here on the WhatsApp, um, one for you, Matt. Earlier on, we were talking about moding, if you went back to the earlier video um, of uh, yourself and winning group um, going up into Rose Bay. And the question is basically, do you alter your uh, tube sheeting angle? In other words, your car in and out uh, when you're going for that high mode? Um, I'm probably not the best person to ask it. Uh, Bam and Brad takes care of all that. <laughs> <He's adjusting laughs> and, uh, but um, from memory, you, and that you, 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 you don't and actually, <laughs> you don't actually like watch watch what's going on or anything. <laughs> nah, my head's out of the boat most of the time. I'm just right. trying to well, find the next bit of pressure. But I think um, in that lighter stuff, we sort of, I think a jib, jib car sheet, jib, uh, sheet, jib sheeting angle is more about sort of how it affects the main for us. Um, we don't use it as I don't think we use it too much for high low. It's more about just right. trying to keep the bottom balance. I think that's what the question was: is was would, would one of your uh, moves be if you wanted to take, yeah, take that high road to actually bring your car in? Uh, no, I don't think we really adjust that. It's a, mm -hmm. that's more of a wind strength condition than a, a high or low. Um, so there's a lot more bigger it. factors in the 18 that affect your height than mm -hmm. than your shooting angle on the jib. Fair enough. Now we've got a couple more slides here, um, Matt. Let's just let's go on to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these are just a couple more shots, which we're just interested in. Um, just basic little setups here on. So that Coco, okay, that's the Smeg from last year, yeah. correct? That's that's yeah. The other Michael Coxon from uh, last year, he didn't sail this year, but um, that was just, we're out training uh, leading into the JJ's the year before, just a, a nice shot. And the rag was actually leading into the JJ's this year. So just really looking at um, similar shots of setup and so on. I've been seeing in Matt's thoughts of the, of the two setups. Yeah. Like, Again, with that, we were looking at the um, twist before on the Tecto. It's um, they both got nice linear twist. The bottom of the bottom leech is up enough to give you the ability to go high. Um, pretty nice by the rag. I'd say that looks pretty similar to what we sort of run. Um, the trapezing techniques are pretty good, all in line with each other. Um, one, if, if I had to criticize, or well, not criticize, but add something of maybe with the rag, they could get there. Uh, boom, more centre line. Um, mm -hmm. quite, quite nice to try and aim for. So, firmer sheet and and sail a little higher. Yeah, so that yeah. Mm -hmm. you do, that once you start eating sheet too much, then you just you just start lose too reach, much. reaching away. Yeah. Start Chasing reaching away. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got to say, when I yeah, I, I normally uh, I have 
have little clinics that uh, I invite people out to leading into the JJs. And mo once we get the rig set up, uh, basically set up, uh, a lot of it's just working on the technique. And um, although everyone knows what they're doing, if you actually got off the boat, it's so obvious when you're not um, um, trapping, like hiking in line. And one of the things watching you guys, you tend to get your body height and your windage all the same. And it's something that I've really pushed these guys. And on that day, I remember we were talking about that with them. And a lot of the benefits are just getting all those basics right. But I think it's really a nice shot there of the rag because they're comfortable to, they've got their crew weight overly flat. They're even you know, arguably lower than the, the wing line. And they've got the boat really flat, even slightly and on top of themselves. And they're quite comfortable to do it. I think that that's... Um, that's a lot of the key and a lot of the improvements can be made in, I think in, in the fleet, uh, that in foot of fleet is actually by doing the training. You talked about your 25 days on the water. I think the average Sydney 18 footer might've gone out 25 days, but a lot of it was racing. And I don't mm -hmm. know that you stop and think and work on your, the little things, which I really notice in the Honda crew. And yeah, there could be a lot more, I think emphasis put on getting all those uh, techniques right and look, knowing what to look for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can tell they're looking comfortable. Um, like I said before, we've been together for four or five years and we're pretty trusting in each other and with the ability to sail, sort of trapezing how we do and sort of sailing a bit lower um, to the water and having the boat on top of us. Yeah, and, and just on that, actually, there's the, the next slide, um, Matt, sort of highlights sort of both both sides of, you know, a well set up rig and, and perhaps not such a, a well you know, set up rig. Do you want to just quickly run us through, obviously, the, the photo on the right, I think, you know, a lot of Australians have probably seen that side <laughs> over the last three seasons. Um, you know, the boat. You know, heel to windward, looking pretty nice. They're looking very comfortable. And then, you know, it's surprising. There's another shot here of you guys looking decidedly uncomfortable, you know? Um, yeah. So this was the, the JJ's, not this one, the one before. I think there were two, two different days. And um, the one day we went out on our rig, we just, I don't know how we did it. We just cooked it up. Our rig was all, all wrong. Um, luckily, we managed to, through boat handling, get away with a couple of top five results, which sort of held us in that regatta. Um, otherwise, it could have been could have gone bad for us if we didn't have some nice jibes and bottom right roundings. But um, yeah, we went we were pretty slow, and you can see just by the body language how uncomfortable we are. Um, we're not trusting of the boat, sort of crouched over. Um, I think that's me, really crouched over, probably looking for something, um, and then compared to a shot where you, you are comfortable, you're trusting in the boat, you're trusting each other, and it just works. Um, so that's, a, as you said, Dirk, that's probably what we're, we're, what we're used to feeling and what people, I guess, have seen over, over the last few years. But um, yeah, so just, it's, quite a, it's quite a good contrast, actually, to show um, what when you're comfortable, when you're not. And once you get that feeling when you're comfortable, it's... Um, Quite an awesome thing. I think it sums up 18 footers through and through because if you, when you're off the boats, looking from off the boats on, that's that the right hand photo looks like a boat at the front of the fleet. The left hand photo looks uh, like a boat towards the back of the fleet. And mm. the only difference was setup and being comfortable and confident in how you sail the boat. And it just, it's a, it's really nice shot to me because you don't have to justify your performance, you guys, but it just shows you can get it wrong too. And, mm. uh, you know, when you get it wrong, it's, it's not a, an easy boat to sail. And, and it gets back to, again, boats on crews spending time on the water to get to this comfort level. I mean, that's pretty amazing. That right-hand photo is like a classic 18-footer shot, isn't it? You're about, you're about six inches off the water, your body's, mm. in a, in, you know, it looks like a pretty choppy nor'easter. And yep. uh, you're just really comfortable to be there. Um, we, I actually yeah. remember that day quite clearly now. Mm -hmm. the, I actually, both days, but the, the day um, we were uncomfortable. We came in pretty gutted because it, it was such a nice day. <laughs> we just we didn't enjoy it because we, we had the setup wrong. But um, you can tell once you get the setup right, it's, it's very enjoyable. Yeah. So just 
the, the, generally, what would have you done different from uh, the left photo to the right photo when you went back and analysed it? Um, what basic changes would have you done to improve your setup and confidence for the second day? Uh, basically, just uh, we didn't know what had happened. Our rig tension had just disappeared, so but we managed to get it back up to the right, the right rig tension. Mm. So you can see it's mostly hanging out of the boat in that left photo. Mm. Yes, yeah, massive. Yeah. So like massively, the, it's the like main, you're massively out on your rig tension. Yeah. The main turned to a bloody spinnaker at the same time. And right. It's it not nice, but... Um, right. So, so yeah, somehow you got out of whack with your setting with your, your, your overall rig tension. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So it's something we, we still can't explain it, to be honest. Right. Don't know what <laughs> Sabotage. <laughs> oh, we, we wouldn't accuse that, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave your boat down the park. <laughs> no, we're yeah, mates. So. We're mates. Please haven't do that to us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, there's, a, there's another good slide here, Coco, which um, maybe you could run us through, which is, um, you know, part, as, as we we're saying, it's all about, you know, time on the water and preparation. And, and, and you know, preparation probably starts when the thing's sitting on its side in the dinghy park yeah. or yeah, in this, the car park. Yeah, this is a uh, Noakes um, uh, sailing and it's in the car park of the, the loft here um, the week before the JJ's. Um, and Sean, Sean uh, Langman, who's a, a stalwart of 18 footers and yachting in general, very, very busy man. And he has uh, Ed Powies uh, assisting him and Ed, Ed does all the running around and Ed, basically gave me a call and asked if I could, could drop by Noakes uh, the day before and have a look at their setup because they were not comfortable with their number two rig. And uh, I went down there, we spent about half an hour and said, boy, is it going to take more than uh, a half an hour in, in, in uh, their yard? So they brought the boat back the next day and we just basically reset the whole rig up, analyse what were their concerns and, and their feeling. And, one of the big challenges was arguably they're the lightest crew in the fleet. They're uh, 220 kilos winging wet. And uh, so I said, well, I think what we should do is relax the rig. And this photo is basically showing, uh, you can actually see the master is very relaxed in the bottom. And what we're trying to do is um, get this light crew to be more responsive because they were just staggering. Um, so we reset the mast up uh, we, to being very forgiving. We um, uh, recut the mainsail luff curve to suit the new mast setup. And we set the jib up. This was Sean as a you know, supporter of um, development. And he uh, was the first to step up when we were um, playing with uh, Helix jibs um, over winter. And he was the first to step up and say, look, I'd love to have a Helix. So he ordered a Helix and a non-Helix, a standard jib and said, uh, hey, let's go and have a play. So we got an opportunity here to, to set the Helix up correctly. And I think that they surprised, and uh, Matty can um, tell me what he thinks, but they went out with the JJs in the number two rig, which you'd think would be their weakest point at 220 kilos and were incredibly competitive upwind in, uh, in that, uh, the f first couple of fresh races. And uh, so, that's where it all started. So I guess the lesson or the, or the point there is a lot of getting speed and getting your head around an 18 footer is got to be done before you get to the park. It's not done on a Sunday afternoon. It, it's those who want to put the effort in uh, before that and get the preparation right. It's a big difference to their uh, setup and their speed. And uh, I think the way they came out for number two rig in the JJs was, was a credit to them and the effort that, mm. that Ed put into getting the boat down and sorting it out. Mm. Yeah, we thought the, um, I thought I thought the notes were very quick. Um, you know, it's actually quite a good photo there. I was surprised at how much mast bend they've got down low. Like, um, yeah. You're yeah. probably well, ahead of us. Well, it's not the norm. It, it's not the norm. It's, it's, no. it's just an incredibly light crew. And I, yeah. I figured because they had the Helix jib and we can go, in, Dick can go into more detail of what the Helix gives you. I think that allowed the light crew to get through the range a lot better with a more relaxed rig. I mean, one reason you don't want to relax your rig too much in the bottom is the fact that you give away rig tension and thus force day sag. Mm. So that's one reason we're nervous about letting the rigs go too far in the bottom. 
So yeah, um, yeah we so we never quite got to playing with our pre bends with the with the new helix yeah. stuff, but um, that's probably something to worth worth to look into. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah, I think the note because the notes are definitely they're, they're very small weight crew. And we noticed that, and I'll, there's a little clip here I'll probably play it now. Um, oh, not there. This one here, and um, so this is us, and I think in second place, the notes are just ripping around the yeah. course. They're leading the um, race. So it's pretty. Yeah. Um, one thing they probably, uh, like you mentioned, Sean, I think Cockney, you mentioned me at one point, he's a, a go fast kind of guy. And uh, yep. he loves he going fast. <laughs> Bow yeah. down and go fast. No matter what he's got, a yacht. <laughs> yeah. Him. He, he, he he likes if he discovered a high mode, he'd be, buddy, he'd be a big threat. <laughs> um, <laughs> you might be listening. He, you yeah. Might kill him. I mean, unfortunately, then they they put the kite kite on around Shark Island and were aiming down the harbour when the, the next course, the next mark was up by the zoo. Yeah, they were but, aiming um, at the heads instead of the zoo. Yeah, uh, yeah. Away. But it, it so was, it's, yeah. It's, show, it's quite it's quite a good example to show that there is to, you, for the eighteen. There's such a range of crew weights you can be. You can be these guys are two thirty, uh, two twenty, two twenty. Well, and then you got winning group at two sixty, and you got others that are two. I think not close to 270, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, quite a lot of main shit he's just going for it. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's exciting times in the future, I think, with this new Helix, Helix technology. Um, you can sort of, we're just on the cusp of it, I think, as, you, as everyone is. But um, sort of playing around the mask bends and we'll be looking into that next year. Yeah. Yeah, so Dick, maybe you can explain a little bit about that helix jib there and why they're getting the benefit of uh, being a light crew. They can get the benefit of uh, getting up range. Well, I think the the, the helix itself is is um, it's a different design of jib, which has um, more fibre or more modulus um, up the luff of the sail um, compared to a compared to a conventional jib. Um, and essentially, the sail is is used with a higher amount of purchase on the on the Cunningham, on the jib Cunningham, or the tack down, whatever you want to call it. Um, so on a helix jib, um, one of the ways to depower is to pull the helix, pull the tack down, which um, on a conventional boat would normally bring your draft forward and straighten the exit um, on the leech. On a on a helix sail, what it does is as the sail as the sail takes more load, it pushes the luff forward. Now this um, effectively flattens the sail, and um, and give, makes the sail a slightly finer entry. So what it does for you is basically just gives a you generate a sail with a with a bigger wind range. And I think you know one of the points that I think is worth mentioning is that you know the the, the winning group who sailed without a helix jib were, you know, on a given day, were, were, were fast. Um, but maybe, you know, with, the, with, with a helix jib, you just end up with a little bit more range. So when you're down range, you can ease the tack off a little bit, deepen the sail up. As you go up range, you're, you're tacked down and flattening the sail out. Um, mm. So maybe you just end up with, or you do end up with more, more range in the sail itself. Yeah, uh, I think also, that it, what it does is more benefit to a lighter crew. Absolutely, in other words, absolutely. the uh, the the heavy crew weight of the winning group um, can yeah. get up range anyway. So yeah. without the jib being uh, as fine on the entry yeah. as the helix gives you, but I think it yeah. gives gives an advantage to medium to lighter crews. And I think this could be a bit of a game changer long term because, as Matt's mentioned, at their crew weight they've got an edge downwind on the heavier crews. And I'd call Matt's crew weight in between medium. You know, around that, you know, that 250 mark is around medium. And uh, I think the 265, 270 is heavy. And there's no question that a 220 is really light, but I think it's actually could open up to give uh, the more medium weight crews and lighter crews better performance uprange, mm -hmm. or upwind, I should say, but they'll have the no doubt added advantage downwind of just carrying less crew weight. Mm -hmm. And I think what was also interesting, Cocker, is that that 
the helix jib actually, um, you know, the, the, the overall load going down the, the luff of the sail and on the forestay itself is, is no, the total amount of load is no different than a conventional forestay and, mm. and conventional jib. So, so in many ways, the rig tune itself doesn't really change a great deal between um, a helix jib and a conventional jib. So I suppose it does make it pretty easy to swap from a conventional setup into a helix setup other than a bit of boat work in terms of increasing the uh, purchase system for the tack. Yeah, Matt, when uh, Matt, we did a lot of work with Matt and ourselves uh, here on developing helix over winter and um, uh, Matt tested it over last winter uh, in New Zealand. And one of the things that I was expecting to happen is that the luff curves would end up quite different on the mainsails because I assumed that the compression would be different, but uh, it didn't change. Uh, well, we found on the boats we tested, it didn't change the, the mast setup or the luff curves at all. Uh, what did you find, Matt? Uh, yeah, same here. So we, we kept our luff curve everything the same. Um, maybe because we don't have enough time compared to like a professional sort of sailing team to play around with it more. But um, with the 18, your mast bends and your mast luff curve is pretty critical to how you sail the boat um, and how you set, set the, all your controls up. Mm. So for us, we, we wanted, well, our biggest brief for the new jibs was we wanted to keep our mains the same, our mast the same. Um, and it worked so that we could, like you, like you talked about, you've literally just banged on a new jib and put in a new adjustment system. Um, and we've got the, the added benefits of, yeah, eliminating some sag and um, not having not having your leech hold up in the gusts, which was mm. pretty awesome. Did, and then did, being able to reduce some camber when it got windier. Yeah, it's probably worth playing that little video, that top-down video we've got there. Um, yeah. Um, so you can just so, see the effect it has on a jib. Um, as it gets pulled on at the moment. So this, is, so, this is, so this is, and, and there you go. It might be quite hard for me to get Well, for the, see. Maddie, for the so layman, if you could point out the, the you know, I'm looking at the luff and I can see as he pulls it on, the luff's projecting forward of the jib. So yes. uh, maybe that's something you could highlight with your arrow, uh, your yep. cursor, and when, when it's happening. So, as we go here, you see this luff up here, and then it's gone to straight. I think with the way the camera's angled, it looks like it's maybe projected forward, but it's pretty much dead straight. Um, yeah. And the, the sail gets flatter effectively. But it's pretty, and you see how flat that stripe's getting, which is pretty amazing because. The normal thing with when uh, you go up range, your forestay sags and your jib gets deeper just when you want it to be flatter and, and your leech closes. So this gives you the exact opposite, exactly what you want. It works just like your mast bending forward. The mainsail goes flatter off the luff and drops the leech out as you go up range. Mm. So, so it's pretty, the concept for boats like we've got, we don't have a running backstay. It's, um, we, don't, we don't have a way to get our forestay tight. Um, other than rig tension for the side stays. Mm. So this is mm. basically all you can do. Yeah. Got, to, got to take my hat off to you to go to all this trouble of getting all this video and uh, doing the, the uh, research on it because it, it tells you exactly the, the story. A photo says a thousand words. Mm. Cool. All right. Okay, now. Okay, super duper, and here we are, Coco, back in the park with the full inventory of on the a couple of last, inventory. Yeah, yeah what was last this one? Su Sunday in uh, always the last Sunday in October. Yeah. So D date, <laughs> drop everything off, get everything done. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, so that was the beginning of the season. No rain, thank God. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think. Um, I think we're almost there. We've had a pretty good run. It's 50 minutes. But do we have any so, questions? Yeah. 
Any more questions? Well, I'm... Um, you said the one about the high mode. I had one question that was emailed to me, actually, from, uh, I think, Glenn. And he asked about, how, is, our, uh, is our master rate different to the Aussies? And to be honest, I couldn't tell you. Uh, I don't know what the Aussies run. So, um, yeah, I think the, our, number two, uh, our master rate's pretty much been set since I started sailing with Dave. And he did that work many, many years ago to get those rates in. Well, we've got a uh, tuning guide that puts uh, uh, con what we call consensus rake and the history behind the rake and, and all the development really is just trial and error. I mean, we can say there's a lot of science behind it, but the, the reality is a lot of it, uh, there's science behind that helix jib, but the rest of it is uh, many, many years, 40 years of trial and error. And uh, all I do is keep up dating our data and debriefing each season to come up with uh, a consensus for the following season and just keep stepping forward in that way. And crews are more than welcome to go with the consensus, which will be the consensus for the next year, whether it's rake set up, um, sail, roach profiles, all those sorts of things. Um, or we can work with them and they can do their only fine tuning if they want to go a little left field in any area, always happy to support it. One great thing about skiff sailing is your hands aren't tied. so. I always encourage people who want to try something a little bit different and uh, see if we can learn from that. But, um, I can share the rakes with you. They're on our tuning guide. I know you've got that, so that's all right. <laughs> okay, there's another question that's uh, just come in here. And this one's for Matt. Um, and we did touch on some of it. Uh, the question is um, for Matt, uh, are your shrouds adjustable and are the D3s and 4s adjustable? And if so, by how much? Uh, yeah, so we've got adjustable shrouds. Well, I think when you talk about D3 and D4, I'm assuming you mean the top. So the four mast. must be top mast. Yeah, top mast and the yeah, prime mast. So we adjust, yeah. Yeah, we adjust those, just those two, and um, they get adjusted at the same time with one lever right. control. So, um, like I said before, we adjust them basically as if just through a wind change. Um, we may only adjust them once a race or maybe two times a race, probably about it. Um, it's not, it's something we're not trying to think about too much. It's sort of a, just a little bit of a minor control to help keep the boat under control. Um, like in the 18, there's so much going on with boat handling and tactics and mm -hmm. trying to get the boat on the course mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. So I can't, I can't say stop my head exactly how much we um, adjust them. Yeah. And um, there's another one here that's um, asking us what cables we're using on our Helix jibs. Well, um, we don't actually use any. <laughs> there are no cables. It's the forestay itself. So it's just the conventional head stay. And, um, and then it's just um, a, just a relative di small dynamic cable up the front. So yeah. Is that no, SK? What did you call it? Um, we get it from Sydney Rigging SK something. Yeah, like there's that. SK ninety nine. Yeah, um, yeah. Which is, so in a way, it's a cable. Yeah. It's a it's a no it's a cable, sharing. but it's it's yeah. not a you know uber expensive. No, it's a the, the loads of that off the shelf. Though in an eighteen footer, you don't need to go to yacht sort of uh, costs and so on to to do it. And with the um, SK whatever it's called, nine is it SK ninety nine? What is it? Yeah, there's SK ninety nine. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, I can, by pulling that on, I can take all the load off the forestay. So it's strong enough through the membrane and it's uh, sharing the load between the sail membrane and the, and the, uh, the um, luff line, load sharing in the luff line. You can take all the load. So it just, if you went into a heavier boat, like a yacht, you need to go up into a proper cable, as you call it. So I think what Dick's saying, a cable we refer to is on, uh, on a yacht. You've got to have a properly constructed yeah. cable. We can buy stuff off the shelf, off a reel to do it. And uh, this is in the class required um, a stainless steel four stay to be in the boat. So we couldn't, mm. couldn't yeah. go. Four stay, four four stay stays there, but we can take all the load off the four stay. The four stay can yeah. go slack. Mm. That's right. Yeah. Super. Okay, guys, I think we're, um, we're almost ready to wrap it up. Someone just asked so, if I wore the mankini at the preso. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
What was the answer? No, not this year. <laughs> We're um, cor- coronavirus said no. <laughs> oh, it would have made me highly God. contagious. Yeah. Something good came out of the coronavirus. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah good. Okay. All right. No well, thank you, thank you, Dick. Yeah. And thank Matt. you. Yeah. Thank you, Crocker and Matt. It's been been great. And if anyone's got any uh, more questions or you want to um, send us any emails, we're all available on our email addresses at North Sales. So uh, we we'll welcome any uh, emails or, or calls. Perfect.